All right, Bronco Nation, welcome back. If you already just got done watching video one, welcome back. If you haven't watched uh, part one, make sure you go back and watch that video. I review and preview uh, all the Bo new Boise State newcomers, staff, and new players. But if you've, since most people have already watched that video, let's just get right into it. You already know what this one's about. We're going to be going over the offense, the defense, the special team units for Boise State, looking at the players, looking at the stats from last year, looking at the newcomers that have added to that roster and how they're going to impact, and just making some predictions moving forward for Boise State. It's exciting. 20 2021 season, of course, kickoff against UCF September 2nd. Uh, can't wait for that. All right, let's get right into it. And if you uh, stick around after this video, make sure you check the remarks because I, I, there's going to be a link to the third video that I'm making in this series where I'm going to review the schedule for Boise State, make some predictions on that, and also preview those games for Boise State. All right, let's get right into it. Offense. So, Boise State's offense last year actually pretty good overall, especially when you consider what happened and what they were having to deal with. I mean, Boise State's offense last year had to deal with losing their starting quarterback uh, for a few games there initially at least, finding out that they had an incredible backup quarterback, of course, the grad transfer, or the, yeah, grad transfer, uh, Jack Sears there from USC, who came in, played incredibly, and then second game that he's able to play there at BYU, his first start, gets hurt. So, or, um, sorry, second start, because he started for Air Force. But anyhow, comes in, plays for BYU, uh, is 4-4 four four on that drive for 28 yards, boom, gets hurt, and then he's out. And now Boise State's relying on their third-string quarterback to, course, to finish that game. Didn't go so well. Hank Bachmeyer, thankfully, able to come back. Uh, able to perform pretty well going forward throughout the rest of the season. But, of course, they lost their number one running back, George Helwani, uh, due to injury. And then, of course, COVID overall reduced practice schedule. But the offense somehow managed to still muster through, put up. Now, technically, Boise State put up th 33 points per game. If you only look at what the offensive offense did and you took take away defensive points or special teams points because there was a lot of special teams points from kick returns, punt returns, the offense actually only put up 25 points per game. But still, considering everything that went on, still a decent year, and I think Boise State's offense performed well. Now, having said that, statistically, it was one of the worst years for Boise State ever um, in their yards per game. And now, yards per game, you can't blame that on a reduced season, because it doesn't matter how many games you play, it's the average of those games overall. So whether you play seven, like Boise State did, or a normal season, uh, 12 or 13 with a bowl game, or 14 with the championship, those points for the game are going to stay the same. And last year, Boise State averaged uh, 347.7 points per game. Sorry, yards per game. Yards per game, that's what I was trying to say. 347.7 yards per game. Now, in 2019, let's compare that. In 2019, Boise State averaged 429 yards per game. This is Boise State's lowest overall yards per game ever put up since joining the FBS in 1996, which was their previous lowest, in that where they put up 331 yards per game. So in the entire 20, see, this is 2020 last year, so the entire 24 years that Boise State has been an FBS program, they have never put up so little yards as they did last season. Uh, now when you break that down into the passing, Boise State put up 241.9 uh, passing yards per game compared to 261.7 in 2019, uh, which is their lowest since 2012, where they put up 223.2 uh, yards per game in the passing game. So again, severe drop-off. That's to be expected, I think, with quarterback changes going as they were. But even with the quarterback changes, Boise State had quarterbacks who came back and were performing well. And it really says a lot when the, a team like Boise State that has, has always dominated in the passing game, always had a quarterback out there who could go out there and sling it around, even with drop-offs. I mean, we, when you go out, so Kellen Moore left, Taylor Thark came in, incredible quarterback, still again. And then you lose uh, Grant, and, and then you lose... Um, Sorry, other way around. Jared Zabransky leaves. Taylor Tharp comes in, throws it really well. Kellen Moore comes in, throwing it again exactly just as well, except better, definitely better. Best Boise State quarterback, I think, ever. Uh, and then he leaves. And even Joe Southwick came in and performed well for Boise State. Grant Hendrick. All these quarterbacks have performed well for Boise State. And Boise State has a great quarterback in Hank Bachmeyer and in Jack Sears. So the fact that the passing game had such a significant drop-off, I think, is quite quite significant, such a severe drop-off is quite significant for Boise State, and I think it's a great thing that Boise State hired an air raid guy in Tim Plow, 
well who can come in and fix this and make sure that Boise State returns to being that team that can get out there, chuck the rock around, and be a team that's going to dominate and push the field, uh, push the field vertically for those long yards and being able to stretch the defense. Now, I was talking about stretching the defense with the passing game suffering so much. The running game was under a lot of pressure, and with Halani out, it did not look good. Boise State only averaged 105.9 rushing yards per game, according to ESPN. Now, in 2019, they averaged 167.3. 105.9 rushing yards per game. This year, 167.3. That is the least rushing yards, the lowest of all time for Boise State in the FBS era. Not even 1996, their first season, did they average as little yards as they did last year. And that, I think, was primarily in addition to the struggles of the passing game, which, of course, fed into each other uh, with the rushing game. But I think that's primarily due to George Halani being out and not having a running back of the same caliber to be able to replace him. Uh, Van Buren came out, did his best. I love the effort that Van Buren puts into it, but he just isn't of the same caliber as George Halani is. And that's why I think adding the running backs that we did in the, as the running back that we did through the transfer portal in Cyrus from from Oregon is going to pay huge dividends because it's going to provide that change of pace, make sure Halani's not taking as much as he was last year so he doesn't end up getting hurt. And also, if Halani does go out, I think Boise State's offense is going to retain that same peak rushing proficiency while also being able to feed off of the increased uh, abilities or increased uh, play calls, that is, in the passing game from Tim Plow. So excited to see what comes up. Boise State also allowed 15 sacks in seven games. In seven, they only played seven games, and yet they still allowed 15 sacks last year. So really what this tells us is that Boise State's one of the biggest struggle, really, uh, I mean, you have all these things going on with the quarterback and running back, but what it really comes down to is the offensive line is the is the factor that's the same between the rushing, the common denominator between the rushing game and the passing game. And the offensive line really struggled. They did not look dominant. They weren't opening up holes. It really shouldn't matter. I could be in the backfield if the offensive line is doing their is doing their job and making sure that they're making that I'm able to get or the running back who's in the field is able to get past that first or second uh, line of defenders, able to is not getting hit in the backfield. You're gonna see some success. It doesn't matter who's back there. Um, so even Van Buren back there, even though he doesn't have the same uh, maneuverability and cutting abilities that Halani does, if the offensive line is doing their job, he's still going to be able to put up yards. Uh, we've seen that with Boise State teams in the past, uh, with running backs who weren't necessarily up at that same caliber when they came in, replacing the number one back, there really wasn't any drop-up because the offensive line was so dominant. And that's really been, I think, the struggle the last few years. You look back to every team in the last few years, 2019 especially with how many sacks Hank Bachmeyer took, but you look back to the last few years, at least going back to 2016, the offensive line has been that issue that Boise State has just not been able to dominate in the trenches like they used to. And so that is where I think we're going to see a lot of changes. Now, Boise State does return every uh, four out of the five offensive linemen. They do return four out of the five offensive linemen, so there's going to be growth, there's going to be development, but there also needs to be some changes. I don't know what that is, whether that's in the training cycle, whether that's in the plays that are being called, or sorry, not plays that are being called, but the um, offensive line formations that are being called, or whether it's infusing fresh blood, uh, such as Mason Rudolph and Will Farrar coming in from Texas Tech. I think both of those players are going to come in and infuse some fresh blood in the offensive line, potentially maybe even put some pressure on those starters to make them perform better. So that's really what you got to look at for Boise State is if their offensive line can improve, everything else will come with that. But adding running backs and, and improving quarterback play and in changing offensive sets, all of those can help but they're really only fixing the symptoms. They're not fixing the root cause, which is that offensive line. That has got to be the number one focus for Boise State. I think it's going to be. I think Boise State's going to come out a lot stronger. But regardless of what happens to the offensive line, I think a renewed focus in the passing game is going to help a lot. And adding that second running back who's able to evade those or power through those defenders when they hit him in the backfield or if the offensive line does their job, hits those defenders at the second level and makes a big plays. Regardless, adding a running back like Cyrus who's going to be able to do that at the same if, level as George Halani is going to pay huge dividends for Boise State. So let's look at that team overall right now first. So Hank Bachmeyer, quarterback position. So we're going to kind of break this up by position and look at what, and just kind of make some predictions and look at who's going to be in those starting spots. So of course, Hank Bachmeyer and Jack Sears, that's the big battle right now. When Besides the cornerback battle in camp, the quarterback battle is probably the most intense. Now, 
Jack Sears, I think he's a pro-style type of quarterback. He can throw it really well. He's maneuverable in the pocket. He's a bigger body, and he can move forward for a few yards there. Uh, we're not in a few yards. He's, he's a decent runner as well. Jack Fields, very much pro-style quarterback, an incredible talent, uh, and I think he can do great things for Boise State. And on the other end, Hank Bachmeyer is just electric. Hank Bachmeyer, again, he's also an incredible talent. He can throw the ball uh, like no one else, I think, in, in the Mountain West. And there's other great quarterbacks in the Mountain West, but Hank Bachmeyer has a special spark to put that ball in big play situations, especially when he's under pressure. He throws better when he's about to get hit than he does when he has time to think about it. Um, he has that, that big play-making ability. So I think Jack Sears is a little bit more dependable, but I think Hank Bachmeyer gives you that big play-making ability that's going to put you over the top. That's going to just not just make you um, at least in the top tier, but beyond that, make you an, a, 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 another level, put you on another level like no other quarterback is. I think Hank Bachmeyer, with his experience, with what he brings to the table, I think he's going to win this starting battle. I think it's going to be close. I think that Jack Sears is really going to push him. I think Hank Bachmeyer, number 19, is going to win this starting battle in camp. I'm rooting for both of them. I think Regardless, I will not be disappointed either way. I am a Hank Bachmeyer fan, but I'm also a Jack Sears fan. Whoever wins this battle in camp, I'm gonna incredibly excited for, and I know that Tim Plow and Andy Avalos are going to make the right decision when it comes to that position. Um, if if Hank Bachmeyer wins this position, I don't expect Jack Sears to, to warm the bench. I think that they're going to have packages for him. They were already mixing him in in packages before he took over that starting role uh, when Hank Bachmeyer was out prior to his injury. I think they are going to definitely have packages for him, and it's not going to just be hand the ball off or throw some random lob. I think he's going to be an actual part of this team, kind of like they would use uh, Montel Cozart to a certain extent. I don't know if it's going to be that much split like it was Montel Cozart's senior season between him and Brett Rippon, but I think it's definitely going to be a position that's going to see both quarterbacks receive playing time, especially if Hank Bachmeyer is the starting quarterback. I think Jack Sears is one of those quarterbacks that is you can really mix in. Now, if Jack Sears is the starting quarterback, I don't know if it, Hank Bachmeyer is kind of one of those players that he's either starting on the field or he's kind of, he's not a position player. You can't just, a package player. You can't just put him in in certain packages and formats and see what happens. I think that the best solution is to use Hank Bachmeyer as the primary starting quarterback and put Jack Sears, in, especially the goal line. That's where Hank Bachmeyer struggles the most. He really struggles once he gets inside the goal line as far as his completion percentage drops, as far as his ability to maneuver and to see in the field. He really kind of drops off. Whereas Jack Sears, with that running ability of his and also his accuracy, I mean, Jack Sears, when you look at, he was 23 of 27, even though he only played in two games, 23 of 27, 332 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions. But Hank Bachmeyer was good last year with 1150 yards and six touchdowns and only two interceptions definitely improvement at least in the interception category over last year even though he played in five games but Jack Sears just is able to bring that second level in the red zone so I, my dream I think would be to see Hank Bachmeyer as a starting quarterback until they get inside say the, the 30 and then bring Jack Sears in the game and finish off drives and I think that you would see Boise State start putting up a lot more points that way but I'm not the coach much smarter minds than me are uh, thankfully at the helm. <laughs> um, thankfully, I'm just here uh, in my studio here, just kind of providing uh, review and analysis, uh, not having to make those tough decisions there. So I'm excited to see what Andy Avalos and Tim Plow come out and do here, but quarterback position is going to be one to watch. Now, the third string battle is also going to be interesting, not going to draw as much attention, but the third string is also going to be important because the last few seasons, that third string position has been a position that's had to be depended on due to circumstances that have intervened. Uh, of course, Jalen Henderson, one of the best third string quarterbacks Boise State has ever seen could definitely have been a starter would love to have seen him in that bowl game that's another story I've talked about that in the past but I think that uh, I'm not sure we have a Jalen Henderson level third string player uh, but Andy Peters showed um he didn't play well in that BYU game. No one's going to play well when you throw him in like that. But he has showed some good things in camp. I'm really excited about Taylor Green, the freshman that's coming in. A bit of a dual threat. His junior and senior year, he had over 4,000 yards passing for 25 touchdowns. We also rushed for another 425 yards between those two, uh, between his junior and senior season in high school. So I'm excited to see him come in. I think he's prob I think he probably has a better chance really at that third string slot because of the dual uh dual threat capabilities that he brings in. He's a player that could potentially be put in some packages and see some playing time. So I'm excited to see him. So my prediction would be that it goes Bachmeyer, Sears, and then Jalen Green there at the quarterback position. So let's move on to running back. Already discussed this a little bit, so I'm not going to spend too much time. I discussed a little bit in my video one there. But George Halani 
incredible running back for Boise State. When he is healthy, he is a career talent for Boise State. When he's, I think he's going to definitely be uh, a player that's going to find some playing time in the NFL. I think he's a player that could be one of the all-time greats for Boise State, especially if he can stay healthy. I would love for him to stick around for another year. I'm not if he has a great year this year. I'm not sure if he's going to do that, but I think if he could stick around for another two years here, this year and next year, um, he could really be kind of one of those players that goes down in the history books for Boise State. But I'm excited to see what a healthy George Lani looks like. I'm hoping it looked like 2019 where he put up such incredible yards. Primary starting running back coming in, coming in strong, coming in stronger from that injury. And I think a player that's going to put up big yards, uh, both in the running game and the passing game, of course. He's also a receiving threat there. And I think the schedule is such that will allow him to be uh, leaned upon because the players of who we're going against, with the exception of potentially uh, Oklahoma State, we're playing against some teams that didn't do so great against the run uh, overall. BYU did pretty good against the run. But... Um, they were playing against some teams that are going to have some openings there, especially with a mixed format where the offense comes out and has that quarterback focus. I think it's definitely going to open up some holes in the running game for George Lani. Excited to see what he can do. Uh, Cyrus, of course, coming in, not just going to be a goal line threat. He's not. He, he and I, I think they're going to split carries um, two, to, two, to, two to one, in kind of that position where George Halani's out there first and second down, and then uh, Cyrus comes out for a third down and maybe stays on the field for a few more. I think that I'm excited to see what both of them can do. I think he's going to have a much better career at Boise State than he did at Oregon, get used a lot more. Excited to see what happens there. As far as the third string running back goes, um, I, I don't think Van Buren is necessarily going to lock up that third string spot. I think when he is not being relied upon as the primary running back and he's kind of bringing, coming in as a change of pace um, or just kind of a refresher there, I think he plays well. I think in 2019 he actually had a pretty good season coming in there and not being relied upon as the number one back. So I think he could lock up that third string slot, but I'm also excited to see what we can see from uh, redshirt sophomore Taquin Taylor, uh, redshirt, redshirt sophomore Tyler Crow, or redshirt junior Danny Smith, any of those players I think could definitely push uh, Van Buren for that third string spot uh, because I really don't think that he's shown that he's that next level talent like Halani and Cyrus potentially here are. I think that we might have a player lurking on the depth charts who can come in and perform and just be that am an another amazing running back. I'm especially excited to see what Tyqueen Ty 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 Tyler can do. Um, heard he had some good had some good scout team type plays. So I'm excited to see what these players can come in and do. And uh, But going forward, Halani and Cyrus are going to be, an, again, that incredible duo. I think they're going to have a great year. All right, wide receiver. Now, wide receiver was a position that looked last year like it had a load of depth. And then injuries kind of exposed that to show that we really were only had two main wide receivers. It really came down to Khalil Shakir and C.T. Thomas. Octavius Evans, hampered by injury his entire career, got injured again. When he's been on the field, he's looked incredible. And I think that this year, fifth times, uh, sorry, Richard Sr., so uh, fourth times the charm there, or fifth time really overall, but he redshirted one year. So fourth times the charm for Octavius Ed Evans. I think he has a chance to come in and finally show what he's got. I think he's an incredible receiver who's able to make big plays. He's a reliable target if he can stay healthy, and I think we're going to finally see that from him. Uh, so Khalil Shakir, Octavius Evans, C.T. Thomas, incredible uh, three-man uh, roster right there as far as receiving goes. Uh, but I also think, so I told you about this last year, we really needed to kind of either develop or recruit new talent at wide receiver to come in and include some depth there at the third and fourth string spots for wide receiver. Uh, I think Stefan Cobbs, I think he and Billy Bowen from what I saw last year, those are kind of my two, my second tier receivers for Boise State that I think can come in and perform well. Stefan Cobbs had a couple of great receptions and runs. He looks like a very explosive threat. I'm excited to see what he can do. So uh, those are kind of be the two guys that I think can come in here and give some playing time. But I'm also excited about these uh, new additions. We have uh, Ben Ford, of course, Eric McAllister. I think Eric McAllister is a deep threat that can come in and make some big plays. Uh, Jalen Richmond and Caden Dudley, also additions. And then redshirt freshman Latrell Capels. Um, I think any of these guys can come in and make some big plays. And I think with Tim Plow's air raid offense, everyone's going to get a chance to touch the ball here and show what they can do. So I'm excited to see Boise State come out and again have one of those teams that's spreading the ball evenly across pretty much the entire roster of receivers. 
and, and really showing uh, that depth that the past Boise State teams have really excelled at. That's when Boise State's been at its top, is when it's had multiple receivers who could go out there and make and catch the ball, even when you didn't have necessarily a number one guy. I mean, Matt Miller uh, was pretty good, but behind him he had Geraldo Boldevine, um, he had Burroughs, uh, even Kirby Moore I think was on the team at that point, uh, if we're looking at the 2012 and 2013 teams. So, uh, teams that Boy State teams in the past, even when they didn't have that big play, th big play number one type receiver, they were still able to get it done because they had depth, and that that's where Boy State has excelled. And then that depth has turned once as led as as certain players excel and promote themselves to kind of being focusing on a couple players. But Boy State's always had multiple players at wide receiver who could make big plays when they got a chance to show themselves. And I think there's some players lurking on this roster or added to this roster that can join the big three, as I'm going to call them, those uh, Octavius Evans, Khalil Shakir, and um, C.T. Thomas, who can join that big three and make some plays. All right, uh, rounding it out here, tight end. I'm excited to see what Riley Smith and Austin Bolt can do in addition to Matt Lauder and Kurt uh, Raftel. Riley Smith especially, uh, the announcers were rooting all year converted quarterback they were rooting all year for some kind of trick play where it's a throwback to Riley Smith and then he throws it down the field never ended up materializing but I think he, that is still in his wheelhouse I think that's definitely that something that we could potentially see this year but he's also a player that can go out there be a reliable receiving threat and make some big plays uh, I think he was in the top five receiving last year for the team so a player who I'm excited to see a lot more of in addition to some of these new additions or developed players from last year offensive line I've already talked about so I'm going to move on from that uh, top offensive player of the year, I'm predicting, is going to be Khalil Shakir, a uh, player that's going to make plays not only on offense, but I also think on special teams when we get to that. But he's the number one player on, on Boise State's team right now. For me, he's like a combination of Titus Young and Austin Pettis. He has the reliability in the hands of Austin Pettis, but the speed and the go-get-it attitude of Titus Young. Of course, Austin Pettis, of course, is also a go-getter. But just the maneuverability and athleticism that, that was a set, another level like Titus Young was, Khalil Shakir's got that. Even when Boise State was down, I mean, even against BYU, he and Avery Williams were still out there running the full field trying to make plays, even when they knew they weren't going to win the game, because that's the kind of competitors they are. They don't care about the scoreboard, they just care about the next play, and Khalil Shakir, I think, is going to be one of those players that really, he's a guy you can build a team around, and I think that Tim Plow is going to do that with his air raid style offense. I think Khalil Shakir is going to have a huge year, uh, not just in the deep threat, of course, but as always in that reliable uh, middle passing yardage and also in special teams. All right, I know that that was long, I'm sorry, but uh, a lot of stuff to review. This is not it's not easy to push through these things, and I don't want to get through it too fast, so I want to make sure we spend time with each unit really analyzing what needs to be seen. So moving on to defense. Moving on to defense here. All right. So defense. Sorry. Long video, so i got to take a drink here. Okay. Boise State's defense. Um, just looking at the stats from last year. So the biggest thing that stands out to me, we will look at the yards per game and the points per game, that kind of thing, but the biggest thing that stands out to me is only three interceptions. That is the lowest all time for Boise. The lowest, they didn't, and they didn't force any fumbles either. That is the least turnovers by Boise State team, at least in the FBS era, because that's as far back as I went in the stats, but the lowest of all time. <laughs> it's inexcusable. It really is inexcusable to turn over that. I mean, even though you're playing seven games, there's no excuses. Only seven games you should have more than three turnovers there. They, it, it, the, it really shows what I'm going to say about the d defense is true, that I think that the defense has talent. I think it has talent across the board, uh, especially last year with the two great cornerbacks there, uh, with Avery Williams and, um, gosh, shoot, I'm just drawing a total blank there. Um, but anyhow, two great cornerbacks um, at, at for Boise State. But across the board, they had... They had key players in certain positions, but those players didn't meld together to perform and create that overall uh, dominating defense that Boise State has had in the past. Boise State hasn't had it, been a team that's had to rely on a few key players. Now, they've had players that have stepped up and, of course, been that number one kind of guy like Demarcus Lawrence or Wheeler uh, you know, or Van Der Esch. They've had players that, that maybe drew the most attention, but they had depth across the field, and they were able to draw together as a unit, and it was that unit defense, that unit cohesion that really made Boise State such a threat in the past. 
and, and really kind of spread the load there to make them a defense, to make them a nightmare for offensive coordinators. And Boise State really didn't do that last year. Now, of course, I think that was to be expected a little bit with COVID because um, when you aren't able to get out there and train, when you're not able to get out there and hit, when you're not able to get out there and run through your progressions, the uh, sorry, your, 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 train, your routes and, and, and your formations, that's going to impact the defense most of all because defense isn't something that you can just get out there on the field and and give what's in what's in you you know whatever that talent is that defense is about training it's about awareness it's about trusting it's, it's about being able to trust your fellow players i, I was a defensive end um, at least in high school i was a defensive end um, and and i know that when you're on the field you've got to be able to trust that your cornerbacks and your linebackers back there have the pass and you're able to go up there and cover the quarterback or cover the run and they have to be able to trust you that you're doing your job in the trenches so that they can be able to go run run with the wide receivers who are going upfield. So there has to be that trust. It doesn't matter how talented you are. It depends on how well you're able to put it all together. And when you lose training like you did due to COVID and you have those big gaps in the season like you did, you're going to see that impact. So it's not surprising to me that Boise State performed worse than in, la in past years. It is surprising they performed as badly as they did, but bringing in Andy Avalos um, as the head coach, brilliant move that I think is going to revolutionize this Boise State team and return them to one of the most dominant defensive units, not just in the group of five, but in the power five period. I think that's coming from Boise State. I'm not sure if we're going to see it this year. I'm going to discuss that a little bit. I'm not sure if we're going to see that this year, but I do think that we're that it is coming and that Boise State's going to be able to return that under Andy Avalos. So, 373 yards per game. Um, it was allowed. It was the most allowed since 2016. Um, 163.7 yards rushing, 209, point, uh, 209 yards passing. They, the big things that stand out to me was when they played competent quarterbacks, which they really only played three quarterbacks that I would classify as, as, as top tier or at least uh, above average quarterbacks in Cordero, um, Zach Wilson, um, and, and of course... Ah. The San Jose State quarterback, who is Nick Starkle. Sorry, I'm having a, a lot to talk about, so it's kind of all blurring together. Nick Starkle, when they played those three quarterbacks, those guys put up huge yards, way above the 209 yards average. Uh, Zach Wilson put up 373 yards, Cordero 393, and, Zach, and um, San Jose State, Nick Starkle put up 453 yards passing against them. So that has got to be the number one em emphasis. The defensive... Uh, the defensive Unit especially against the rush, especially considering that they played Air Force, which is an option team, is going to put up a lot of yards. That average is not as bad as it looks. It was actually okay. But the, the passing game, when Boise State played competent passers, they would stop them on first or second down. But when they were given too much time on third down or really any down when their rush didn't get there fast enough, there was openings in the secondary. So that comes from developing a rush ability that's going to be able to get to the quarterback better than it did last year, but also developing a, for a scheme that's able to allow for that extended time if necessary so that there's no openings, there's nowhere to go with the ball. Um, so new focus, new staff, bringing the hammer. I think Boise State's going to do that again. They're going to renew that focus under Andy Avalos and be that team defensively that they were in the past, was able to come out there uh, and light up the scoreboard defensively, but also limit the scoring by the offense of the opposing teams. All right, so uh, D-line, every single player pretty much is back. Um, so And Demetrius Washington, who was hurt last year, uh, comes back. Uh, Canijo and Irwin, who has six sacks. Those are going to be your three biggest players there. I think they're going to take a step forward, all of them together. I think they're going to take a step forward and be better than they were last year. But really, I mean, all the players on the line, on the line was not, I think, the issue, even though the getting to the quarterback was not great. The line actually played decently. I think it was once you start moving beyond that, where especially in the secondary. Secondary was where the, all the most of the troubles began. Um, so I think building some depth with some of these new recruits and developing, uh, based on developing the players that are already there, is going to play some some dividends, renewed focus by Andy Avalos. Linebackers, pretty much every player back again. Uh, Riley Wimpy, who has 61 tackles and one sack, down from 2019, where he had 83 tackles and seven sacks. Part of that due to reduced season, but also part of that due to um, just other factors there that it ended up impacting with uh, being off a defense overall that was not playing as well. And Riley Wimpy was part of that. He what he didn't he didn't have the dominant year that was expected of him. Certainly not a Curtis Weaver type dominant year or Demarcus Lawrence type dominant year. Um, everyone kind of expected Riley Wimpy to be that next second next tier top tier talent for the defense, and he played well, but he didn't have that kind of separate from the pack, um, you know 
first, second round draft pick potential that those other players did. So I think we're going to see a new focus out of Wimpy coming in for this year. I think he's going to actually play really, really well, just like he did in 2019. Excited to see what he can come in and do. Ezekiel Noah, second on the team, of course, returns at linebacker. So linebacker is locked up solid, I think, with a renewed focus, uh, increased training, and an ability to actually get out there and practice and build some trust in the defensive unit. I think that we're going to see much improved performance from the linebackers. But you know what? There's five freshmen on the team coming in, and there's four of the linebackers on the roster. All of them are going to be pushing those two starters to perform their best, and they're also going to be pushing for some playing time. I think we're going to see a very deep linebacker unit that's going to come in and perform well and be able to be one of the great linebacker cores that Boise State's always had. Secondary, um, so cornerback Jalen Walker. That's the word. That's the name. I was, sorry. Apologize for forgetting that earlier. Uh, anyhow, secondary loses Avery Williams and Jalen Walker. Uh, they're top two uh, defenders. Jalen Walker, second on the team in tackles, but they're top two cornerbacks there. So that's going to be a real struggle. I mean, so at, at least with quarterback, you have two proven starters. With cornerback, it is a complete question mark. We have no idea who's going to be the guy to step up. Uh, Spencer Daniels has said that he thinks that there are two, at least two players on the team who are at that Avery Williams, Jalen Walker level, but it's going to be total. It's, it's a total miss to us, especially with the fact that training uh, camp is locked out due to COVID. We can't, you know, we can't even get in there and see. So it's a total miss to us. We have no idea, a total mystery. We have no idea what's going on and what's going to be, who's going to be that player to step up. Uh, of course, uh, I think that uh, Markel Reed with 15 tackles last year and Tyre Le Tyreek LaBeouf, uh, both of those players have a chance to uh, continue to improve on performances from past years and to be able to come up and play well. I think that I'm not sure if they're Avery Williams, Jalen Walker level because we just really haven't seen enough playing time out of them. We also have redshirt freshman. Um, Kaniho, uh, but different Kaniho, not not the Kaniho that's at at um, that's in on the line. It's uh, um, Kanohi Kaniho, uh, Damon Cole, and then a freshman incoming. We have Isaiah Bradford and Jalen Neal. So I, any of those players, really, I, I think I I'm not going to make prediction for secondary because I have no idea who's going to be at that cornerback position, and I'm not. I think that Boise State's going to lose a little bit of a step at talent in that position because you just really can't replace an Avery Williams type level player just like that. Uh, but I don't think it's going to matter. I think the defense is going to be better overall because of renewed focus, renewed training time, and um, increased emphasis on the defensive staff. That's going to that unit cohesion defense, that unit defense, that team defense is going to be what's most important. Not who's most talented at different positions. It's who can come out there buy into the program and be able to put that performance onto the field. So I think that it's not going to, I don't think that there's an Avery Williams and Jalen Walker type level cornerbacks right now. I, I hope I'm proven wrong. I don't think that I, um, I don't think that right now, like I said, that there are those two level players. Hope I'm proven wrong. But I think that whoever's in there is Andy Avalos and Spencer Daniels are going to put together a scheme that's going to work for them. That's going to allow Boise State to be very competitive defensively this year. Um, and then just wrapping it up here, Top defensive player, uh, I think it's going to be Riley Wimpy. So I, I, I kind of forgot to make an overall prediction here. Um, I, I apologize for that. So defensively, overall prediction here, I think Boy State's defense is going to be a, one of the... Set, uh, they're above average defense, I think, in the Mountain West. I think they're going to be towards the top tier of the defense. I don't know if they're going to be top in the group of five, top power five, but I think they're going to be good enough to make Boise State competitive. Having said that, I think the offense needs to dramatically improve and show that 2019 or prior offensive abilities to may have Boise State come out here and have a great year. I don't think they're going to be able to pin their hat on the defense and rely on them to win games. I think it is going to be offense here that's going to be winning the games, um, but with that renewed emphasis, this year and then going forward, I think Boise State's defense is going to be able to get back to eventually that dominant level. And I think that the offense is going to put up huge numbers in the passing and run games, greatly increase that point per game average offensively. And I think the defense is going to be good enough to allow Boise State to win a lot of games. Watch my third part video where I'm going to review the schedule and see how Boise State does this season. So final part of this video, I'm going to do this real quick. Special teams, final unit to look after. Boise State, really, I the unit I was most surprised with with Boise State was their special teams. Now, their special teams have been getting better over the last few seasons uh, after struggling mightily in the past, recent past, um, in, bo in, in really all phases, um, punting, kicking, returns. Avery Williams, of course, helped out with that return game, but... I, Boy State's special teams unit, I, I give them an AA plus from last year. I mean, they played outstanding. I think the kick return, 
Um, so there's a quick turn of uh, defense could have been a little bit better and it would have been nice to see them block some block kicks and that kind of thing. But overall, the, the special teams unit played outstandingly last year. Uh, Jonah Dalmez, what an incredible surprise. Came former walk-on, earned a scholarship, well-deserved. Former walk-on who comes in last year, Boise State, I don't know how they didn't have a recruited kicker. It's kind of been at a point, lack of emphasis, and Boise State did not get this because of trying. They lucked into a kicker at this level. That's a real issue. I'm going to say that right off the bat. Boise State has always hung their, t their hat on their special teams unit. I mean, Chris Peterson would talk about how you know, a lot of teams put their second string players on on special teams. Boys Day would put their number one players. I mean, Austin Pettis and Tyus Young would play on special teams. Ian Johnson played on special teams. I mean, Boise State put their best players on special teams. It was a it was a unit that you had pride to be on. It wasn't something that you were grumbling going, "Oh my gosh, I, I already I'm out in the field so much. Why do I have to be on special teams?" It was a unit that you wanted to be on. Only the best of the best got to go out there and play on special teams and show what they got. And that's where the hammer really comes from. Is that play that 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 blue collar attitude of going out and make and putting playing your hardest in a unit that doesn't get a lot of praise and so that has really dropped off I feel like in recent years but I think that with a renewed special team with the special renewed uh, abilities of special teams units going forward I think we're going to see a renewed emphasis in that emphasis on that Boise State lucked into a great kicker who was 7 of 8 last year and was 2 of 2 from plus 50. I think he's going to be one of the best Boise State kickers all time. I'm excited to see what happens with him. Um, Vasquez, Joel Vasquez, who I have been critical of in the past, who I've always said has an incredible leg but no consistency Built some consistency last year. He had his best year uh, with average 41 yards uh, per kick and a long of 71, career best. Finally put that ability with consistency, and I think he's going to have his best year this year. I'm excited to see what he can do. I think he's finally playing up to uh, and, and reaching that level of punter that he's always, show, always shown he had flashes of that he could be for Boise State. So I think the combination of him, Jonah Dalmas, and Joel Vasquez is going to be an incredible combo for Boise State in the kicking game. Uh, and then, of course, big loss in the return game with Avery Williams. I don't think the return game is going to be quite as good as it was last year, but I think we have enough talent and speed on this roster to replace it and uh, we're not necessarily replace it at the same level, but get close to that. Um, I think we're going to see Khalil Shakir, potentially C.T. Thomas, um, out there uh, playing some kick return. Of course, Khalil Shakir has experience in the kick return game. And I think we could also see um, Kniho, that is uh, the uh, lineman, kick, kick, kick Kikalua Kaniho, um, not Kanohi Kaniho. Um, he actually has 74 yard return in 2018 and a um, 44 yard return in 2020. Um, he actually has a touchdown uh, on a kick return. So I think we could see him in the kick return game. I think Khalil Shakir is going to step up and be that player, both on offense and special teams. He's going to come out and perform incredibly well. Um, I think if Boise State can clean up its coverage a little bit, they did allow three punt returns of plus 15 yards and two kick returns of plus 32 yards, which is pretty good. But I think that could be cleaned up a little bit. If they can clean up their coverage and, re and replace Avery Williams in the kick return game, Jonah Damas and Joel Vasquez are good enough to make this one of the best units, uh, special team units in the Mountain West, if we can really just uh, replace those holes there. Kick, the kick special teams player of the year, I think, is going to be Jonah Dalmas, who's going to have another incredible year. Boise State, if they can't get it in the end zone, uh, they have a player who can reach it from anywhere. And I think that Boise State's going to have an incredible year, offensive, defensive, and special teams, but especially in offense and, and special teams. So that's my review of the Boise State team overall. I'm, I'm hitting 38 minutes. It's one of my longest videos ever, um, but there's a lot to go over. It's an exciting time to be a Boise State fan. A lot of newness in the air. Um, Andy Avalos coming in, first-time head coach. The last two first-time head coaches have both won a Fiesta Bowl their first year. <laughs> you think about, you know, Chris Peterson comes in, goes undefeated in 2006, and um, Brian Harson came coming in 2014, goes 12 and two, and beats Arizona in the Fiesta Bowl. So I think I I'm not saying Andy Avalos is going to do that necessarily, um, but you watch my next video. That's my uh, we're going to be reviewing the games that's coming up for Boise State, the season preview, um, and making some predictions on that. So watch my prediction to see what I say there. I'm not going to zip my lips now, and I can say anything more about it. But it's going to be an exciting year. I think Boise State's going to put up a lot of offensive numbers, especially in the passing game, but also in the running game. I think the defense is going to improve enough to make them a unit to be 
uh, that's going to put some concern in offensive coordinators' heads and make it so that the offense isn't carrying all the load. I think special teams is going to continue that upward trajectory we've seen in the last few years. So I'm going to put the link in the description. If you missed my first video on the newcomers, I have covered them a little bit here. But make sure you go back and watch that video. It's a good review of all the newcomers. And make sure you watch my third installment. I think the one that most people are probably most excited about where I go through the games this year for Boise State. Uh, the, and I make some previews and some predictions of all the matchups for Boise State this year. Alright, thank you for watching this video, and as always, Go Big Blue!